Hey you guys, what is up? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on wherever you are. This is your girl Najwa. I'm so happy that you're here. Please do me a favor if you have not already, go ahead and click that like and subscribe button. Click the bell so you know whenever I post a video. Guys, um, I can no longer with my conscious support Chris Rock or Adam Sandler because I cannot support the black face of white racism. Let me say this again. I am no longer supporting Chris Rock because I cannot support the black face of white racism. Now, what am I talking about? So you guys might remember this famous slap that happened about a year ago um, where Chris Rock insulted Jada Pinkett Smith calling her G.I. Jane, despite the fact that she has an illness, despite the fact that she has alopecia, which was not his first jab at the Smiths. He's taken jabs at them for a very long time. And I think he's had a bone to pick with them, uh, some sort of jealousy or insecurity with them for a very, very long time. And pretty much a basic human instinct, Will Smith took great offense to this wanted to protect his wife and and smack the, the the you know what out of chris rock and <laughs> the same public the same social media monster that cannot think for itself apparently that just kind of sways and glows whatever wherever the wind blows it and everybody just sort of adopts the same uh, stance on things. The same social media, the same public that decided that Amber Heard was a liar, succubus, narcissist who wasn't really abused and that Johnny Depp was a saint. That this pill slugging, alcohol drinking, uh, pill popping, coke snorting, uh, sweaty, dangerous man was the victim in all of this. And the woman who provided buckets of evidence that this man abused her was the succubus, lying, you know, whore of Babylon. The same public, social media public, that decided that Johnny Depp was the saint and that Amber Heard was the succubus thinks that Chris Rock is the saint and Will Smith is in the wrong. Which, okay, we'll get we'll get to that in a second. They were both in the wrong, but let's get to the implications for a second. Let's 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 talk about similar things. Chris Rock went after my girl Meghan Markle, which you guys know my channel supports Meghan Markle fully. I hate the abuse that the media has driven towards her just for other people, like media companies and celebrities, to make more money and get more clout, just riding off the tailcoats of this woman. And not thinking, this is so much deeper than this. This is about race. This is about, you know, misogyny. This is about, like, progressing as a human race. You know, you might just see, oh, she's just some chick who married a prince, some some actor. But this all is related together. Chris Rock, Meghan Mark, it's all related together. But I'm going to get to that. The same social media, okay, the same public that saw the firm, uh, King Charles, Queen Camilla, Prince William, Princess Kate, um, even Prince Andrew, and the UK media as the saint in all of this, and Meghan Markle as the one calling out racism and xenophobia and misogyny as the villain. That, that's the same public that is crucifying Will Smith and uh, glorifying Chris Rock. And speaking of Meghan Markle, for the, the squaddies listening to this, um, what's his name? Nate the Lawyer. I've said before on this channel, I feel like Nate the Lawyer is clearly just a black face of white racism. Who are most of his subscribers? All most the ninety percent of his videos are trashing Meghan Markle from a quote unquote legal standpoint, <laughs> and most of his followers, 
you can tell are white people, British white people, who hate Megan, hate the fact that she shined a light on this nasty problem. But they're not racist. That's just the way that overt racism works. Now, let me just explain to you why this Chris Rock thing is so atrocious to me. So first of all, don't make fun of someone's wife with an illness. I found two channels I want to I want to recommend to you guys. So I found this video. Um, so this video is entitled Chris Rock's special was trash. <laughs> this is from The Conscious Lee. I saw this last night and I have subscribed. I recommend that you guys subscribe as well. Um, his analysis was so, so, so good. And you know what? This guy reminds me a lot of my brother-in-law. <laughs> I've told you guys about my sister, Shanti. She's like a ghetto version of me. And, and this really reminds me of her husband. Like, um, and there's nothing wrong with that, dude. Like people got different education, different backgrounds. I was talking to my, my husband yesterday and my parents were 40 when they had me. Like, literally, my parents were 40 when they had me. My oldest sibling was 16 years older than me. 40. They were 40 when they had me. Um, I have seven sisters and brothers. My oldest sibling is 16 years older than me. And both of my parents had been married multiple times, like blended family type stuff. And by the time that I kind of came around the block and I was in high school, I was getting older when I was even like primary school, I guess, high school, going to college, my parents had reached a certain level of financial stability. Just like, I mean, just think about the people listening to this video. You guys are probably somewhere between your 30s, just like me, either you're, you're a young, uh, millennial, you know, in your 30s, or my, like my parents' age, so probably somewhere between... 30 and 70. Let's say that's pretty much who's listening to these videos. You know, people like me, you, you're you like me and my husband. You're you're putting your footing into the financial and economic well, world. You're um, working hard in your careers. You're putting some money away in savings. But think about it. The time that you're going to reach 50, the time you're going to reach 55, you're going to be a little bit more established. And so um, basically, I had, a, I had a little bit of a... Um, <laughs> Basically, I was spoiled. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but basically, I had the opportunity to have a different education. And um, that's all that it is. That's all that it is. Like, but my 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 family, ghetto or not, country, redneck or not, because I got some of them black rednecks in my family, too. They're all intelligent and they're all sweet, kind nature. That's the kind of family we came from. And, you know, there was a point where I definitely can say that my family was probably much more um, lower middle class than they were just standard middle class by the time I kind of got older. And so, you know, I, I know what it is to struggle a little bit. I know what it is because, you know, maybe I didn't experience that as much in my childhood. I know that my siblings probably kind of had to um, make a little bit more sacrifices than I did. And so the conscious Lee, he's talking about that. He's talking about, you know, seeing black people, seeing black people in poverty. You know, even if I didn't get to experience as much, you know, um, and my siblings never got to experience poverty. My parents and my grandparents, they've always kind of been, um, you know, those people who can get along with all types of people, like coming from a church background. So it, it was never, ever. Yeah. But um, on my dad's side, I will say like my mom's side certainly faced a bit more privilege than my dad's side did, for example. And also when I went to school, when I went to public school, um, I went to public school from ages, I say nine or 10 until um, what? 14, 13, 14. And 13, 14, I went to a public school as well, but it was a specialized art school. So it was basically, you know, 20, 200 students, you know, and you had to audition to get in and all that stuff. But when I was in public school from those ages of like nine to 14 and, and living in a suburb, but living in a primarily black suburb, you know, public school, you get to... <laughs> You get to rub your elbows with people from all walks of life. So these could be people living in, uh, you know, $500,000 homes. I remember there was a basketball player's son who went to my school. Um, but there could, you could, there could also be people who were living on, 
you know, food stamps, living in utter poverty, living in the ghetto, living in living in projects. And I'm sorry, but black people have experienced that for the past 400 years. I mean, 500 years. And in the past 100 years, it's gotten better. But you cannot ignore systemic racism. You cannot ignore systemic prejudice. And you know, it seems like there I was a comedian, my husband and I were watching yesterday. He's like, why do white people want black people to get over it so fast? <laughs> He's like, slavery? Oh, that was just, you know, 300 years ago. Get over it. Oh, yeah. Uh, what, what do you say? Um, uh, v- voting? We gave you guys that, you know, 60 years ago. Y- y'all got uh, February out of that. You got Black History Month out of that. It's like, guys. I'll link that in the video too. Um, that was a Netflix special, special on comedy about um, talking about the N word. Actually, you know, white people always want to say the N word. I, I prefer that nobody says it. It's just a, it's a terrible, terrible, gross slur. But you know what the conscious Lee is getting in here. I, I really can't even wrap it up for you because it is so complex and nuanced and. Um, wrapped up in the entire black experience, especially the black American experience that, um, and he's very poetic. Uh, he's like, I think he's a public speaker. I don't know. I need to do more research on him, but I really, really was taken away by it, especially when, you know, this, this, this man clearly, he doesn't talk like me, you know, like he clearly has a different background from me, but I love supporting black people of all different types of backgrounds, different type of swaggers and everything. Because at the end of the day, as I've said on this channel, you know, the marginalized in society, black and brown people, women, like we are, you know, people of different religions other than like Christian white people. If, if we don't advocate for ourselves and if we don't advocate for each other, nobody will do it. So unlike Chris Rock, I don't trash people. I don't throw black people down the bus unless they're being crazy. Now, Chris Rock, I see him as someone who is much like Candace Owens. You know, I don't like to put down black people too much because, dude, we, we, if we can't, if we can't stick up for each other in society, nobody else will. Do, do you know that it was only very recently that in the U.S. law, black people were even considered fully human? We used to be considered three fourths of a human. Hold on, I gotta check that. Is that even accurate? Is it three fourths or was it one fourth? I gotta check that. Either way, it's atrocious. Three fifths. Three fifths of a human. <laughs> How much lower do you have to get? Three fifths of a human. So, anyway, um, yes, what I noticed was on these channels, speaking of that, that social media monster that can have a mind of its own. On the social media channels, and there is another video as well I'm going to link in the bio. Um, there was Jesse Wu. Um, both of them, again, th- th- they are not me. And maybe we don't have the same background. Maybe we don't have the same thoughts, the same education, the same vernacular or way of speaking, um, the same way of dealing with race. But I loved everything that both of these people were saying. So I'm going to link this in the bio for you to give you a different perspective. Because to look at you know, E.T. to look at um, all of these random, um, you know, news sources, to look at uh, CNN, whatever, who has it, you know, in this thing, Will Smith is the evil. He is the other. He's the bad guy. And Chris Rock is the saint, you know, but this, I have not watched that Netflix special, but to my understanding and from hearing the jokes that he told, it's just the black face of white racism, you know, and, and the conscious Lee, he says, you know, Chris Rock says in the show, well, my mom taught me not to, to fight in front of white people. <laughs> and he, the conscious Lee is like, well, did your mom teach you to antagonize and belittle and objectify black women in front of white people? Because that's what he's doing. And white people take that as the green light. They take that as the green light to be like, oh, well, he's he's being really, um, you know, 
not very ethical in this, so let me not be ethical too. And then the social media monster just takes on the mind of its own, just, you know, victim blaming and, and you know, just, it's, it's disgusting. So I want to talk about a few things. The reasons why I really, I'm not with this. And, you know, Adam Sandler, he has had diversity in his films. But now that I'm looking back on this and I look at his close relationship with Chris Rock, I feel like it's been tokenism. You know, I feel like I was swindled like we always do. We see a few black people in a movie and some lines that sound black, but, you know, it's probably a black person maybe wrote it, but with the oversight of a uh, white or Jewish big boss, big man in media. Now that I think about Adam Sandler's movies, I feel that way. And, you know, I've had friends that say, oh, Adam Sandler, I think his, his movies aren't that funny. It's true. He's not that funny. You know, like Rob Schneider is hilarious. The guy with the cross-eyed, you know, thing, the, the, the football, the dude on the football field can't remember his name they're funny the the actors that surrounded him in his movies are funny but you know Adam Sandler is not funny and to see how fanboy clout pushing he is behind this Chris Rock thing I know it's about money so just really quickly <laughs> Will Smith is so um hor- horrendous atrocious vilified by Chris Rock. Let me just type this real quick. So Chris Rock net worth. Let's see here. So Chris Rock's net worth is 60 million. 60 million. Now Will Smith net worth. Will Smith's network is 350 million. Why is that? Why is that? I'm going to tell you from my perspective because that's the only perspective I can speak from. Growing up and to this day, Will Smith has been one of the people in the black community who has made it so far into his career, breaking down barriers. You know, between black people, white people, all types of people, Asian people, Hispanic people, watch Will Smith. In the black community, in the African-American community, long, long time, Will Smith has been seen as a great role model. He's been seen as someone who shows family values and, um, you know, promotes from within his community and supports other blacks someone who is connected to his faith and his spirituality and who hasn't let Hollywood take that from him because there is some shysty, nasty stuff in Hollywood. And, okay, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith have an open marriage, have had an open marriage, okay? But aside from that, you have seen one of the longest-lasting, committed married couples, black couples, in Hollywood that you've ever seen. Something a little bit more reflective of the actual black community. Yeah, they're not perfect, but they have stuck together and they have children who are so smart, so progressive, and they support their kids. Their kids are are breaking down barriers and doing stuff that our grandparents probably could have never imagined, you know, good or bad. And Will Smith and Jada Pickett Smith support them along the way. Jada Pickett Smith has had a career that has spanned from like the late 80s, what, late 80s, early 90s until now. One of the most iconic black women. Red Table Talks? Seriously? These are people who are not only giving to their craft, giving to their art, but doing something of good for their community. And they have long since held that. You know how people used to look at the the Huxtables, which is not, it's not even a real family. People like to think of the Huxtables as just Bill Cosby, but that's not what it was. It was the beautiful writing of the Cosby show. People used to look at the Huxtables and think, wow, that is what a really strong, positive black American family looks like. Huxtables remind me of my grandparents on my mom's side. Nothing different. You know, I think that a lot of middle class black folks 
have seen that type of dynamic for a really long time. But again, Hollywood is a shysty, nasty place. And so Hollywood wants to portray black people as being nasty, you know, polygamous, ghetto, uh, cheating, open man, you know, whatever, whatever. But amongst black people for 30 years, 20, 30 years, Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith in their own respects and as a couple have been a point of inspiration for the black community. And now Chris Rock is the face of white racism wants to destroy that image. It wants to destroy that image. And the far right, the, you know, they want to attack very much cancel culture, you know, because people can say things that, you know, society deems as politically incorrect, incorrect, and, you know, somebody gets canceled and the far right apparently hates that. But, you know, people like Chris Rock doing it it's okay. And and you know what? It's like they don't they don't take the time to understand the subtle the subtle um curvatures, you know, of of microaggressions and racism that's not overt. They you know, I'm speaking about this concept of Chris Rock being the black face of white racism and I guarantee you for you know, at least 90% of the white people who land on this this video is going to go right over their head, either voluntarily or with an unconscious bias. But hey, that's just what it is. Luckily, my husband's white and he's one of the woke ones. So I got really, really lucky. I want to talk about um, black sticking together. And sort of the concept out of Africa. Now, again, I'm just speaking from my perspective on this. Not really about statistics, none of that. But black people generally, as I've said, have been a marginalized part of society for so long that we have seen that unless we stick together for one another, we're not going to get anywhere. Now, examples of that could be the Underground Railroad. You know, Harriet Tubman leading the movement of the Underground Railroad with the help of some very handy, helpful abolitionist, you know, leading ourselves to freedom, sticking together. The other point of that could be straight out of Africa when, you know, the French, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the British invaded African territory, you know, killed babies, took people out of the land you know, kidnap children. Those tribes banded together. Even feuding tribes banded together. Another example of that is, you might have heard of little parts of cities like New York or San Francisco called things like Koreatown, Chinatown. Well, what you might not know is in cities all around the world, as someone who's traveled, Africans have something very, very similar. Pockets of towns where you'll see people from Togo and people from the Congo and Cameroon and Nigeria and Ghana. And this is where instead of the entire community being filled with the norm, which is stores owned by the dominance, you know, Instead of it being that, you see supply stores, print shops, convenience stores, tobacco shops, bars, restaurants owned by black people. And in cities around the world, that could be either, you know, African peoples or that could be black Americans, black Europeans. Why is that? Again, because if somebody else won't stick up for us, no one will. Right. And um, then you you look back into your history. If you are a black American, I'm going to I'm going to speak a little candidly on this one. If you're a black American and you notice that you have fortunately ended up into a place of a middle class black American. If you notice that you have 
ended up into the socioeconomic status of a middle-class American. But you have encountered other blacks who are much less fortunate, much less fortunate than you. Blacks who come from um, a working class background where they live in projects, they're, they're struggling on food stamps, they, they um, come from generations of people who have relied on the welfare system just to get by. Um, people coming from generations of domestic violence. If you have observed that, and you've observed a clear distinction between how you were raised, the privileges you were raised with, and the privileges some of your black other your your fellow black folks were raised with, maybe take a look back at your history. So I take a look back at my history, and like I said, on my dad's side, I think it's a little bit different, but on both my mom's side and dad's side, on mom's side, mom was well, she is now a retired teacher. She has a PhD with her concentration being on black boys in the American educational system. My dad was a screenwriter before he passed. He owned his own painting business. My grandparents, my granddad was a deacon in the church and owned a construction company and owned an investment property company. My grandma was a stay-at-home mom. My granddad, well, my grandma's mom sadly died when she was very young. But my granddad's, on my mom's side, my granddad's mom owned a general store. She owned a hosiery line for women. <laughs> and I've told you guys, I mean, I, I got a very, very expensive degree in advertising, worked 10 years in the corporate space, and notice, oh, wow, there is a lot of microaggression and glass ceilings and racism and sexism here. Um, I think I shall go the entrepreneur route. And then I found out, okay, so this is pretty much in my genes. I see it now. And then on my dad's side, you know, I don't have as much history going back as further. I need to talk to some of my aunts, maybe. But on my dad's side, I do know that my granddad owned a barbershop. My granddad on my dad's side is sort of a stark contrast to my granddad on my mom's side because he was a woman beater, to be honest. But um, there was entrepreneurship there. So if you're black and you have found yourself to be raised in sort of a middle class family and you've seen people, even if that's lower middle class, you know, I don't claim myself to be anything more than just basic, like basic middle class, you know, but I have seen friends growing up in adverse poverty and it was a stark contrast to what I grew up in. And I thought, wow, it's not the same for black folks everywhere. So why is that? Why is it that, you know, for example, my grandparents on my mom's side were able to, and, and this is in Birmingham, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, as I've said on this channel, where I was born, one of the racist, with the most racist roots in that entire country, a place where the Ku Klux Klan would burn down a church and kill four little black girls. One of the most racist places in the country. And how is it that my grandparents were able to inspire people from the poor white community in Alabama? I'm not gonna say just the white community because middle class blacks in America and poor whites have long had a, a I'm not going to say a similar struggle, but they've long had a special relationship because they've been ignored and marginalized. And right now, Trump is is he's been capitalizing on that stuff. Just like I said in my last video, Le Pen, Trump, Boris Johnson, they capitalized on poor white people. And now they just are lost. They're lost on this. But let me, let me get back to the point. I'm getting somewhere. So if you look at black middle class and you look at poor whites and you look at that special relationship, why was my grandparents able to, you know, inspire poor whites in their community? Because they would go around and donate food. Um, if somebody like they literally would go up into the trailer park and donate food <laughs> Le legitimately, you know, white people love my granddad. 
because he's a he's a wise man and he barely drank, barely smoked anything in his life. You know, he's not he's not perfect by any means, but um, he's long since been woke. He's long since been woke. And it, he, you know, but at the same time, he doesn't transform that into hate for other people's even people's with the same skin color as people who have been his aggressors. He's always been respectful. Mr. Moore. Oh, Mr. Moore. You know, and, and going into white parts of science, because how is he going to have a construction company, an investment property company in Birmingham, Alabama, one of the most racist places without going through the dominant class? How is he able to do that? Because he's always been respectful of, of women, of black people, of white people, of people of any kind. And he's a man of faith. He approaches everything he did with God in mind. Now, thinking about that, you know, but he also collaborated with a lot of black brick workers and, and other black companies, you know, black peoples within the community. He never, ever let down other black people, even if they were struggling with things like adultery or uh, alcoholism or drug abuse. In fact, he might reach out to those people more, give them a call, see how they're doing, Bring them some food, you know, try and get them into a program because that's just the kind of people that my grandparents were. So I want to take you back to this idea. So there's an idea. Um, I don't even know if this is, like I said, I'm speaking from my experience. You put three white men in a room and you put two black women in a room so i know chris rock is is a man and will smith is a man but i'm just saying this to demonstrate to you that there is systemic racism that exists is deeply ingrained and there needs to be white people out there who are not afraid to be woke even though that's been vilified why, why? and i wonder why anyway watch my video on woke and you'll understand um there needs to be white people out there who are just as aware as um, black folks are of these injustices that have been interweaved within our society to speak up and advocate for this. So I want to make a comparison to this, this idea with women really quick as someone who is, you know, like, as I said, reached a senior level in my career in advertising and worked among many, many pale faced men. And that has definitely been a point of contention. There can't be two black women in a room. There can't, there just can't be. Take a look at Tyra Banks and Naomi, Naomi Campbell, you know, if you really want to <laughs> understand that dynamic a little bit more. But you put three white men and two white women in a room or two women, period. <laughs> this is that point where like patriarchy and racism are like walking hand in hand in the street. Two women, period. But let's just focus on black women because the race part is, is really, really it's interweaved in society. You put two black women in a room and three white men and you know what's going to happen. The two black women are going to be pit up against each other. They're going to be pit up against each other in subtle ways, in subtle ways. It's almost just like how people uh, fight pit bulls, you know. <laughs> Mike Vick got such flack for fighting pit bulls in his backyard, you know, people paying for it and stuff. But what about white privilege that has pit black people up against each other in the workplace for years now? It's pretty much the same thing, you know. And this is with two human lives or three fifths of a human life. How do you want to put it? The other thing I want to talk about is I hate the N word. I don't say it. But I'm going to say the house N-word and the field N-word. Now, for those of you who don't know about the house N-word and the field N-word, during the times of slavery, often there would be people, black peoples, black slaves, who would work in the house. And they were a small minority compared out to the, the black workers who would work out in the fields, picking cotton, picking wheat, sugar. Um, you know, mending the fields. The people who worked in the house often were a little bit more well-spoken, maybe slightly more educated, 
oftentimes looked a bit more European, I guess, than the people outside. So maybe they had lighter skin. Maybe they had fairer skin. Maybe they had a finer grade of hair. But oftentimes the the house inward was that way because they were a child of the master and, and, a, and a slave. So, um, yes, right now, Chris Rock is definitely in the black community getting the label of being a house inward. Why? Because he's being the black face of white racism. And so don't be misconceived. There are lots of black people talking about this. There's lots of, cha- and white people too, people of all races. There's lots of channels talking about this fact. But as we said, social media, the monster, it can't think on its own. It can't think on its own. And so, yeah, it, 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 can't, it can't recognize that there's something deeper to what Chris Rock is doing. But he is being that quintessential house N-word. So, um, and I also think that light skin and dark skin really does come into play with this. I, I see it. I think it's atrocious. In the black community, there really is, in the African-American community, there really is um, this nasty feud between dark skin and light skin. You'll actually see memes all across Reddit and Tumblr with this stuff. And it's just atrocious. Black people, we would have to be helping one another. Chris Rock, from the very beginning, should have been helping Will Smith. You know, and maybe, you know, discussing those net worths again, I really think that there is a competition, a jealousy here. Somebody even said in a comment, maybe at some point Chris Rock might have gone after Jada Pickett Smith and she wasn't having it, you know, because he's an awkward dude. (laughs) Oh, man. And I really love that show. Everybody hates Chris. But, you know, I feel like we can make an exception for Everybody Hates Chris because we get to take a look at his childhood, you know, which, you know, that was probably sensationalized to a certain extent because many of his backers are rich Jewish men. You know, the fact that Jews and blacks have faced similar battles and that in the past there's been this beautiful relationship between it. The fact that we have now... A large part of the Jewish community, like Bethany Mandel, who are joining this white supremacist, far right, extreme kind of perspective, it's it doesn't bode well for me because Jews really should know better than that. In the times of Jesus, Jews were black. They really should know better than this. But it, hey, we all came from Africa, so we're all black. People hate that. Um, what was the other thing? I mean, I I basically touched on, on everything that I think, I I think that, um, it's also really interesting. The people who came to Will Smith's aid when he did slap the, the taste out of Chris Rock's mouth because he insulted his sick wife. I do think it's interesting who came to his aid. Uh, Denzel Washington, Tyler Perry, and the entirety of the crowd at the Oscars. The entirety of the crowd. Now, let me double check on that. Hold on. Because I, I, I often get the Oscars and the the Academy Awards mixed up. Was it at the Oscars or was it at the Academy? Yeah. Yeah, it was at the Oscars. If you noticed... <laughs> After the slap, when Chris, when when Will Smith went up on stage to accept his award, the entire crowd gave him a standing ovation for defending his wife. So what changed, I wonder? Could it be that it, it slipped into the hands of the social media monster, the one that condemns Amber Heard and not Johnny Depp, the one that condemns Meghan Markle and not the British monarchy? Could it be that's what happened? It got into the the hands of the monster that is social media. So, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And Denzel Washington knew exactly what was going on. I guess it takes a little bit of wisdom and experience to get there. I Maybe that's what we're dealing with. Maybe we're just in a time where 
you know, people don't want to think about wisdom, faith, you know, forgiveness. What would Jesus do? I mean, we've shown constantly as a society that we think that we are above God, you know, but Denzel Washington said in an interview with T.D. Jakes, you know, who are we to condemn? How do we have the right to condemn anyone? So, um, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Will Smith getting a standing ovation and now him being uh, <laughs> enemy numero uno. But I guarantee you one thing. Someone with $350 million net worth compared up against someone with $60 million net worth. Um, Will Smith will land on his feet. And many of us out here see right through Chris Rock. I can't support him anymore. I can't. I, I, you know, with, with, um, seeing how disenfranchised my people have been. And always in life having opportunities to either hand a fellow black person a hand or to push them down so that I can run just this little bit further. Which, I mean, 60 million, clearly being the black face of white racism hasn't allowed you to run as far as you can. But, I mean, that's the price of life that I think I'll have to pay. You know, I am someone who... Will Smith, I mean, he didn't get $350 million just out of nowhere. He didn't have $350 million back in 94. It took years of giving back to his community, of doing the right thing, of accepting those roles that he felt would elevate all types of people, you know, to get to that $350 million. And like I've said, for example, with my channel, there are some really dubious clickbaity type stuff that I could do to make my channel be very, very successful, have, you know, 775,000 subscribers really quick. But I would be giving away my morals. I would be giving away that deep, deep, inherent need in me, not just want, but need in me that comes all the way back from other generations, generations back of giving a hand to other black people and other people, period instead of pushing them down. So I would rather take the long route and the right route. So that's basically all I wanted to say. Um, people are really, really, really attacking Will Smith right now. But go on these channels like The Conscious Lee, go on these channels like uh, Jesse Wu, where they're saying exactly what I'm saying, and you'll see a lot of people agree. But you go on these other channels, the ones where the algorithm have pushed them out and synthesized them and made them the ones that are the ones at the top of your feed. Um, yeah, they they have a lot of critics, a lot of critics of Will Smith, a lot of praisers of Chris Rock and a lot of critics of Will Smith. So we have to wonder why that is. So, guys, I'm going to leave you at that. Stay woke. Um, let's take the term woke back. <laughs> I'm going to start using it now forever. Like, I'm going to be using it for the rest of my life just to annoy and nag some, you know, hyperventilating, aggro nerd, far right extremists out there. Guys, stay woke. And um, I can't wait to see you guys at the live stream this evening, tonight, wherever you are, whatever time zone you are. Um... Do me a favor, if you have not already, again, go ahead and click that like and subscribe button. Click the bell so you know whenever I post a video. I'll see you next time. Bye.